Uh, hello, everyone. Thanks for joining me today. I believe this is like the last session of the summit, so I'm actually surprised with the amount of people in the room. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about the Terraform and how we use to provision our infrastructure on top of OpenStack Cloud. A uh, quick introduction. My name is Mikira Gubenko uh, with Mirantis. Uh, my main focus is uh, automating things, uh, things like provision of infrastructure and uh, application deployment. So let's quickly review the agenda for today. Um, we'll, we'll talk about what is infrastructure as code. Everyone is probably already doing it, but I'll just remind some key principles. Uh, I'll introduce Terraform as a tool we use in our team to, to manage infrastructure as code. Uh, we'll talk about how to actually write the Terraform code, what building blocks it has. Uh, state management and team collaboration is topic that we were struggling the most in the beginning, so I'll address that. Um, I also describe how we structure our Terraform code for multi-environment use case. And of course, nobody, nobody's perfect, so I'll talk about the dark side of using Terraform. And we'll wrap up things with the Q&A session. All right, so what is infrastructure as code? I like the definition from uh, Keith Morris, who's the author, author of the great book with the same name, Infrastructure as Code. He states that it is in an approach to infrastructure automation based on practices from the software development. So basically, you can manage your infrastructure the same way you manage your software projects. The key principles are using the configuration definition files where you declaratively describe how your infrastructure should be looking like. Uh, things like VMs, uh, uh, images, networks, uh, volumes, etc. cetera. Uh, version control should be the source of the truth for everything. It has all the possible benefits, things like uh, it's easy, easy to track changes, easy to collaborate, easy to roll back, uh, et cetera. Uh, you always test your application when you roll it to production, and the same approach should be applied to the infrastructure. So every change should be extensively validated. And you should push your changes more frequently. It's always easier to provision a couple of VMs now than uh, provision them later with a whole bunch of other changes. Uh, what, this, oops, uh, what this gives us is uh, uh, we will be able to build our environment the same way, uh, the same way as uh, assembly lines manufacture products. We will have a consistent, uh, consistent and predictable result, uh, and our environments will look the same exactly as we wanted. Since uh, no human intervention will be needed, uh, the process will be fast and efficient and re repeatable. Uh, all your in infrastructure pieces should be easily replaceable and disposable, uh, so there is no thing such as don't touch that server anymore. And since 100% uh, I know, 100% engineers I know hate to write documentation, uh, the documentation will be captured in form of uh, definition files, code snippets, and scripts. Uh, so what are our options of using, uh, in, uh, on uh, applying infrastructure as code on OpenStack Cloud? In the recent um, OpenStack survey shows that OpenStack CLI clients are still the number one approach to provision resources. So basically, developers put this OpenStack server create or Nova boot commands into the ad hoc scripts, put them in the repo, and that's how they provision their infrastructure. But these scripts miss core features like item potency, templating, simultaneous run dependencies, etc. cetera. Uh, tools like Ansible and Chef are more focused on managing the configuration files, so we're talking about the servers that are already provisioned. Um, OpenStack Heat project is closer to what we were looking for, but um, unfortunately, it's uh, locked into the OpenStack cloud. And I think many of you already have uh, like hybrid clouds. And if you want to use like AWS or Google Cloud, you will need another tool for it. Uh, and it also does not separate the uh, planning phase and execution phases, so you cannot validate your changes before, uh, before you apply it. And uh, then there is Terraform, which we'll, we'll describe a bit deeper. So what is Terraform? Terraform is a tool for building, changing, and uh, 
version infrastructure safely and efficiently. Uh, configuration definition files provide Terraform information on um, what resources uh, it needs to, deploy, to provision for a single application or your entire data center. And the basic workflow working with Terraform looks like this. Basically, it consists of three steps. First step, you, of course, you write your code. Uh, in other words, you declaratively describe uh, what resources for the environment you need, things like VMs, load balancers, networks, etc. cetera. Uh, then uh, you run Terraform plan, which will generate uh, the execution plan uh, that it will need to run to reach the desired state you described. And then you run Terraform apply, which will basically go and uh, provision those resources. And after it provisions those resources, it will create a so-called state file where it will store the information of what resources it created and what's basically managed through Terraform. Uh, all right, now brace yourself. A lot of code slides are coming, so I hope you will be able to see them just fine. So imagine our, our Hello World application. Terraform uh, parses .tf files within the directory you run it in. So we create the hello world.tf file and uh, with the, this content in it. Uh, first, we, we uh, specified the provider, in our case OpenStack, of course, where we supplied uh, parameters such as keystone, URL, uh, tenant name, tenant password, username, etc. cetera. Uh, for the resources, we, we added uh, OpenStack Compute Instance, which is basically AVM and supplied it with the things uh, you need when you boot VM through OpenStack, things like image ID, flavor ID, keeper, network, etc. cetera. In, in addition to that, uh, we created a resource for floating IP and specified the pool where to allocate it from. And the last, we created association between this floating IP and the VM we created. Uh, now we can uh, run Terraform plan, which is uh, going to go and uh, compare the local state of things with the state of things in the actual cloud and create execution plan on, uh, on how it will reach the desired state. Uh, so in our case, it suggests to add uh, to resources floating IP and association with floating IP because the instance was already created before. Uh, so. After that, after you, you reviewed, reviewed this execution plan, you can uh, basically apply this. So it, do, it, it will go and create uh, those resources. That easy. Uh, so what building blocks does Terraform has? Uh, the first thing is um, providers. As I said before, this Terraform tool is um, vendor agnostic, which means you can use endless uh, number of providers, things like AWS, Google Cloud, Kubernetes, Bitbucket, etc. So you can basically manage your multi-cloud, multi-environment application uh, through the single tool, uh, from this, even, even from the single repo. Uh, resources are, are the components of your infrastructure. As I said, for OpenStack, you can create instance, floating IPs, cinder volumes, etc. Uh, variables define the parameterization for your Terraform code, and Terraform su supports strings, maps, uh, lists as possible types of variables. Uh, the outputs define uh, the way to uh, highlight some of the variables, uh, to highlight some, some of the variables when uh, you run Terraform apply. So basically, in our Hello World example, uh, I want to know what floating IP will be assigned uh, to the VM because I, I didn't know it before I, before I ran it. Uh, the provisioners are the way to run some scripts after you provision certain resources. So, uh, for example, if you provision VM, you want to bootstrap it, or you clean up, or you want to clean up resources before the VM destruction. I would say. Uh, the most uh, useful ones are remote exec and null resource, and remote exec will run the, uh, the script on the just provisioned resource, for example, VM, and the null resource can run uh, those scripts uh, on any resource within the current environment. Um, I think that 
Terraform provisioners won't replace uh, configuration management tools, things like Ansible and uh, Puppet, but you can easily hook them up using uh, the specified provisioners. Uh, and then there, there is modules. Uh, modules are the self-contained packages of Terraform code, which are used for code reusability. Uh, if, if you work at, uh, with at least one programming language, you know what modules are for. And uh, Terraform modules can be stored in different sources. Uh, the, the most popular one, of course, is the local deer, and you can also grab it from GitHub or S3 object storage. And nested modules are supported too, uh, so you can nest one module into another so to structure your code uh, even more to organize it better. Uh, and look, let's look inside the module. It's the same code we used to provision the resources, but we added some additional uh, variables to it. And after this, we can execute this code multiple times just using the module statement and uh, as the source specify this, uh, this module directory. And what it will do for us, it will create these free HA proxy nodes and free uh, N7 Node.js no, uh, nodes using the same uh, piece of code. All right, state management and team collaboration. As, as I said, we struggled within, with it at the beginning with our team, and I'll explain why. So, um, as I said, Terraform Apply creates a so-called state file where it stores the uh, resources that are managed through Terraform. So, in case uh, you are working alone on the code, you can just go with the local, fi lo local file and it will work fine. But uh, once you add more uh, engineers to the team, uh, there's two problems. You, you will have to sync your uh, state file between you two, or how many people, and uh, so uh, everyone will be running the Terraform apply against the fresh version of the file. Uh, the second problem is you want to make sure that you don't run Terraform uh, together at the same time. So you, you will have to create some kind of uh, locking mechanisms uh, to prevent that. Uh, and we, uh, within, our, within, our, within our team, we evolved this rule. So if only one or two person work uh, with Terraform code, uh, we suggest just to store it uh, in the object store. Yeah, Terraform, uh, Terraform supports uh, remote storage to store object store, uh, to store the state file, and uh, object store is one of them. You can use Swift or Amazon S3. Uh, and uh, what it gives us, you can, uh, it, it will be a single source of truth for everyone, so you don't need to, to sync that file between, between team members. It always stores in the same in the same in the same uh, storage. Uh, it also can be versioned and encrypted. Uh, some of you might might ask why don't just use Git. Uh, the uh, the problem with Git that it's easy to for, to forget to push or pull changes of the state file, and it still will end up that you are running Terraform apply against the obsolete version of the state file, which is which can break your infrastructure. So if you one or two people, you can use it in object store and coordinate between you two how you run it and when you run it. So if your team is bigger, maybe two to five people, I suggest to coordinate using the change requests. So basically uh, everyone in, in the team aware of when you run it and uh, what changes you introduce into the environment. And if your team is even bigger, I suggest uh, that there should not be any human intervention in running Terraform apply. So uh, you can use any CI system for it. Uh, in our team, we created uh, this uh, Jenkins pipeline that uh, based on the commit will go and run Terraform apply and stop right there. Uh, then operator will go review the uh, changes uh, in the Jenkins. And so it will review, he will review the Terraform plan. And if he approves the, uh, approves the change, uh, Jenkins pipeline will go and apply it. So that's how we, well, that's how we solved it for our use case. And we were, uh, we were playing with the system for quite a while, like building some workarounds here and there, and then uh, this happens. So in uh, 0 0.9, HashiCorp introduced state locking in Terraform. 
So this basically, it gives you ability to lock all, all the writes if, if somebody already ran in the Terraform apply. And, but unfortunately, not all the backends are supported yet. Swift is not supported. And I believe the uh, Amazon S3 is the best place to store it uh, and uh, use uh, locking in DynamoDB. Uh, with all that said, I still believe that the CI system is the better choice to go right now. It's more reliable and safe way to run those Terraform applies. Uh, so with uh, storing state file remotely and uh, building those um, Jenkins pipeline uh, solved us some problems, but another problem we were having is isolation. When you first start with Terraform, you are tempted to create all of your configuration within the same, within the single file, all the set of files within the same directory. But what it will do, it will create the single state file for all of your infrastructure. And if you are working with the multiple environments, the, the whole concept of the environment that it should be isolated as much as possible. And if you are running uh, the same code for every environment, it's, it's breaking uh, that rule. So we decided to go with uh, this uh, directory layout. We basically create uh, the separate directory for, for each environment um, to, store, to store the code. But in addition to that, we also isolate uh, services. So, our, for example, our MySQL service has its own infrastructure state file. The front end app uh, has its own state, uh, state file. Um, what this gives us is that if someone makes a mistake with the code, uh, you can break uh, only, s only single service, and it will uh, shrink your uh, blast radius of the damage. OK, the dark side. <laughs> so while working with Terraform, we discovered some disadvantages or uh, things we didn't like. So as I said before, uh, the blast radius is, is a big thing, because uh, if you manage all of your infrastructure in first Terraform, you basically give your keys to your kingdom to the Terraform. And if you uh, screw things up, you can basically break your whole infrastructure. So isolation is one of the steps to, to solve it and to address that. Uh, it's still young, so you'll, you'll hit the bugs here and there, and the compatibility between even minor versions, sometimes not that good. So you should consider that when you upgrade your Terraform binary. Uh, I believe that, I personally believe that Terraform has a steep learning curve, especially because of the uh, interpolation seed syntax it has. I didn't even touch it uh, in my presentation. Uh, so go figure out yourself. I, I think it will surprise you. Which brings another, uh, point is that, uh, yes, you will have to learn additional language, which is uh, HashiCorp configuration language. Uh, Terraform tends to store every possible piece of resources it provisioned to the uh, uh, state file. So you, you'll have to think about how to encrypt your state file so those sensitive credentials w will not be uh, seen by anyone. And the last part is, of course, there is no rollback, so you, sh you should double check your changes, uh, made some code reviews, uh, and be careful when you run Terraform applies, because it, it can break things up. Uh, that's it from me. Thanks for your time, and I'm ready for some Q&A session and microphones right there. So um, you said there's there's no rollback. Um, is rolling back your plan file, your Terraform file, and then applying a second time? Are there gotchas there? Uh, so uh, by meaning uh, by saying no rollback, imagine if you change the image ID on your uh, resource, it will go and just reprovision those VMs that we're using this uh, resource. So if you like provision ten VMs with the older image, and then you go and replace the image and run Terraform apply, it will, it will basically wipe all the VMs. So uh, uh, that's what I was saying when I said, like, uh, uh, there is no rollback. So you cannot roll back wiped VMs or volumes. 
Thank but, you. But, but yeah, you, uh, the, the one thing I like about Terraform that you can uh, easily apply incremental changes, uh, which are like, if you need additional VM, you just go at the Terraform code, and when you run Terraform apply, it will incrementally add this VM without touching the previous resources. So um, what happens exactly if uh, the resource, the, the virtual machine, is not mentioned in the state file? Uh, Terraform just won't touch it, right? Yes. It's, uh, the state file it just uh, describes of the resources what Terraform should manage. And if resource is not in that file, it won't touch it. So let's say if you are provisioning a brand new stack every time you do the release, and then after that you are wiping the old stack, mm -hmm. um, it's a less uh, scary solution. So mm, can you reiterate the Well, basically, the if, if your deployment uh, is done by provisioning a brand new stack next to the previous stack, mm -hmm. this step does not hurt the previous stack, right? Yeah. And then once you're confident your new stack is working, you can destroy the old Yes, that's, that's one of the ways to address that. OK. And how does destruction go? Uh, you just run Terraform Destroy. And it will ask you, I, I, yes, I remember two times, like, are you sure? Are you sure? And then it will go and wipe everything. So that's easy. Thank you. Uh, how do you do unit testing? Uh, so there's a couple of things there. there there's like a, I don't remember the name of the tool. I'm just curious, like your practical experience. Um, uh, my practical experience, we just uh, uh, use this CI pipeline w with the uh, with the Terraform plan, and that's how we test it. <laughs> but there there is some, there is some tools uh, that can uh, address the testing itself. You're probably talking about test kitchen. Uh, yes. Like yes. <laughs> mentioned one of the advantages is the uh, uh, multi-cloud provider support. Um, how portable is your plans from one cloud provider to another AWS to OpenStack? Unfortunately, the, uh, you will have to manage all those environments with separate code because um, the resources names are different for each environment. So for OpenStack, it will, the resource name will be OpenStack instance. And for AWS, it will be AWS instance. So it's not portable, right. but uh, it will still uh, it, it still gives you ability to store everything within a single like repo or project. Is it not port is it not possible to? Uh, I believe get not. Portability? That's too bad. <laughs> Hi. Uh, another question about the update. Uh, does Terraform have an ability to uh, apply um, something like a slow rolling update to clustered services, or is it going to go out and just try to update all of them simultaneously? I believe you can sp specify, um, when you run Terraform apply, you can specify as additional uh, variable the resource you want to run it on. So basically, if you want to run, in, run the update on the set of the machines, you can do that using CLI. Can you have it automatically roll through, or uh, do you have to do that as an I, operator? I don't think so. You, you probably will need to create some kind of a wrapper that will go and do like canary deployment or some sort of okay. sort. Thank you. You probably forgot to mention that uh, Terraform is able to import resources from your current stack, but it's a very painful <laughs> operation. I don't know if yes. you have experience with this, but if you have any uh, stack of any size, you have to import every single resource manually. Yeah, that's uh, that's the also one of the b uh, big things because um, it's usually easier to build a new stack than import uh, the previous resources to Terraform. So, yeah. and there was a question about uh, the resources that don't exist in your state state file. If a resource already exists but doesn't exist in your state file, you probably want to import it. Inside the, inside the state file. And I also wanted to mention that the feature you meant, the, the thing you mentioned that if you uh, don't 
run uh, plan before apply, mm -hmm. it can have unimaginable yes. <laughs> uh, consequences. And that makes Terraform basically unusable for CI CD pipelines. Because what we do is we run Terraform plan in our, in our GitLab pipelines, mm -hmm. then the pipeline is paused until someone comes examines the yeah that's the same the same idea we use <laughs> <laughs> so you, you don't have any solution for this you are still need this guy that checks the yeah, yeah. okay a, a question on the state file you, you said that it, it stores uh, it, it will store your your credentials in in plain text mm -hmm. in the state file um, it does does terraform have any built-in method to uh, encrypt or decrypt the state file, or is that something we have to handle as, as a separate job? So I didn't try it, but there is like uh, some plugin on a GitHub someone wrote to somehow, store, to somehow um, uh, encrypt it, but I didn't try it yet. Uh, I don't think I mean, it, it was doing it like a couple months ago, <laughs> at least for AWS resources, for sure. For uh, Amazon, I don't remember the component, like a SQL database. It was storing the credentials inside. And there is a bug for it, and it's still not addressed. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. And my other question is uh, whether you can have uh runtime configurable features, like for example, virtual machine would generate a secret key, and then this secret key would be passed to a different virtual machine configuration. Uh, or maybe even on the fly, uh, during the application, go to some URL, pick up something uh, from there, and then use within the configuration. So as I said, uh, uh, in, the, in my presentation, there is a thing called uh, provisioners which you can put everything there, like it's basically a bar script or something, and you can go and do anything you want, even on the local machine, like on the machine you are actually running Terraform, or remote resources on, on the machines that just was just provisioned. I believe that's one way. Thank you, just a quick one more. Uh, so Terraform can do both virtual machines on OpenStack and, uh, for example, uh, Kubernetes yes. uh, containers. Yes. Re regarding the locking with the DynamoDB, is there any plans to use something else that might be more open stack friendly than having to have <laughs> AWS? As I said, just use these uh, CI system like Jenkins. Um, would you say that OpenStack integration with Terraform is good enough? Is it stable? Is it production ready? When you want to create something it's actually created? Yes, actually it, it, it's good and uh, we use it in our production and uh, it has, I, f I, would, I would say it has everything needed usually. So things like instances, load balancers, security groups, key pairs, images. So it what supports else? all resources in OpenStack? Yeah. Okay. I wouldn't share this opinion with you. I didn't say it's production ready because <laughs> at, at least you cannot import OpenStack instances. It, it's still, still not implemented. But if, if we are talking about like a new environment. And, and during, I think, two or three months I'm using it, I hit around seven or eight bugs <laughs> that I reported to Terraform developers. But to, uh, to say something good about them, if you report the any issue to GitHub, they usually fix it in one or two days. But sometimes when you see the fix, you really s say to you like, oh shit, they committed 100 lines of codes and, jo and merge it in several hours without any review and they pull it to, to, to master and then another day they find another bug. It's like, we, we call it a hipster company <laughs> because those yeah, people that are writing Terraform, it's, it's right in Go. <laughs> and uh, I don't want to uh, sound like someone who doesn't like Terraform. I like it very much, but it needs one or two years to, to finish. Sure, and it changes rapidly. And uh, as a side note, I think like they, their main use case is AWS 
And AWS support is uh, like phenomenal. It's, it's stable and all resources are supported almost so, but yeah. Any other questions? Right, thank you.